So good morning, folks. I am Charles Duncan. I'm a managing director and senior biotech analyst at Piper Jaffray, and it's a pleasure to welcome you today to the fourth annual Cell and Gene Therapy Conference. The next presenting company, as Josh mentioned, is Sangamo Biosciences, and it's a pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Elizabeth Wolf. Dr. Wolf, I've known for many years. I've covered this stock for a long time, and this is the first time I've ever sat up here and conducted this kind of presentation with her. So, Liz, why don't you tell us a little bit about Sangamo and what you're up to? Thank you, Charles, and thank you very much for your um, attention today. Um, this uh, presentation will contain forward-looking statements, so I'll refer you to our, um, our filings with the SEC. Um, Sangamo is focused on the development of a totally new class of human therapeutics that functions at the DNA level. And our goal here is not to generate chronic therapies for disease, but to develop a single treatment that will ensure or provide for patients a lifelong, a ther lifelong therapeutic benefit. We are developing a technology platform, our zinc finger DNA binding technology, or ZFPs, and we're primarily focused in the programs that we're currently taking forward in therapeutic genome editing, and something you may all have heard a little bit about. So the programs we're largely focused on at the moment are monogenic diseases, that's diseases caused by a defect in a single gene, and I'll tell you a little bit more about those in a minute. Um, we've been developing this technology for a while now. Um, I can remember back in 2005, 2006, when we first started to talk to investors about the potential of therapeutic genome editing, and people would say to us, well, if this is such a great idea, why isn't everybody doing it? And at the time, and actually currently, we had the high-class problem of having a dominant intellectual property position, and so it meant that we were the only ones in the space. As you know, there's been an enormous amount of interest in genome editing, and so um, we believe an enormous amount of excitement for the potential. We think this is a really good idea. Um, as we've heard earlier, um, we're developing this technology from bench to bedside, and when you're doing something like that, it's not, not just, as one me uh, panel member said earlier, flying the plane, you're building it as you go. So you have to think not only about developing the technology, but developing appropriate delivery methods to the tissues that you want to target, and developing processes that enable you to uh, synthesize the, the drug on a clinical scale, as well as the regulatory pathway that you have to, you have to follow to get those um, programs into the clinic. So I'll tell you a little bit about our technology. As I say, it's a platform technology. It's based on the zinc finger, the ZFP protein. This is a natural protein found in man. It's found in organisms from yeast to man. Nature's been using it for a long, long time. It's a sophisticated protein, um, not as complex as it's made out to be. We can, each protein, each finger binds three to four base pairs of DNA, and we can alter those, um, alter the binding surface of those proteins to bind to different base pairs different sequences. This is something that we've done. We've built out a large archive of zinc fingers. We join those zinc fingers together into arrays that mean that we can target a specific domain. And then we add a functional domain. And for genome editing, the functional domain is a nuclease. Um, and when we add these zinc finger nucleases to cells, they target the DNA to which they're uh, meant to be addressed to. And if they arrive on the DNA in a particular spacing that we've designed and, uh, and uh, orientation, then they'll make a double-strand break. And this is the beginning of therapeutic genome editing. We can use a cell's machinery then to do two different things. We can either knock out a gene or we can add in a DNA sequence. And um, we're using as I say, primarily our genome editing platform in the, in the uh, indications that we're taking forward. 
Um, we believe that our zinc finger um, platform has a number of strengths that will make it uniquely useful for therapeutic genome editing. So when you're thinking about making a therapeutic as opposed to a research reagent, you need to think about a number of different things. You need to think about precision, you need to think about potency, and you also need to think about specificity. And we have, as I said, this large archive, which means that we can precisely place any zinc finger nuclease on any sequence that we want in the DNA, which is very important if you're looking to integrate a gene in a specific place. We also can manipulate not just the DNA binding surface, but the whole molecule to enable efficient and very specific genome editing. So we can target a specific site and target away from a non-specific site. We have a flexible uh, a molecule which enables us to do uh, any type of delivery currently that we're, we feel is required for the target tissues that we're going after. We use RNA and um, viral vectors. And we, are, um, we have an excellent safety record. We are in the clinic. Um, we, have, uh, we began our studies in uh, our HIV program in T cells back in 2009. We've treated over 80 subjects. They have circulating modified T cells, modified with zinc finger nucleases, and this has been very, very well tolerated. We move then into hematopoietic stem cells, and we have a, an open phase one, two clinical trial in hematopoietic stem cells in our HIV program. And this, the information that we gleaned or the knowledge that we gained there informed our, part, our collaboration with Biogen in the um, hemo, hemoglobinopathy space in um, beta thalassemia and sickle cell disease. And, um, We've recently um, have phase one, uh, have cleared um, INDs by the FDA to enter into phase one clinical trials for the very first in vivo genome editing um, applications. And we are initiating clinical trials in hemophilia B and also in HERLA syndrome. As you see, we have a number of other INDs which are going to be filed uh, through the, the rest of this year, and that's the timing is shown on this schematic. Finally, we have the, uh, a solid financial position and the cash to enable us to take this forward. So we began the year with 210 million in cash and we've guided to ending the year with 150 million. And uh, in the remaining time, I'll, I'll ask, answer some questions by Charles. Fabulous. Uh, Liz, as you might imagine, I have a couple. Well, that's not really true, I have many. Uh, but I will be looking to the audience. If you have any questions, please uh, just raise your hand. Liz, I'm going to start uh, with one question because you're kind of on the front lines of dealing with questions from investors as well as uh, also having deep, deep knowledge about the platform because of your training, scientific background. But I wanted to ask a question from one of the largest investors that I've been asked recently, and that is, does Sangamo have enough money? What is your perspective on the balance sheet? Is the company in a position to achieve a significant value at a milestone with the current cash? Yes, I. Can you hear me? No. Uh, yes, I believe. I believe that we've, um, as I mentioned, we began the year with um, 210 million in cash, and we've guided to ending the year with 150 million dollars uh, in cash. And this is without any additional partnerships and with taking the pipeline that we, I showed you at the um, on last but one slide through to IND and into these clinical trials. And historically, I think that one of the things that Sangamo definitely has is a very, um, is a good reputation as uh, efficient stewards, financial stewards of our, of our cash. I would agree. I would agree with that. I think over the years that has been the case, but the real question is now in terms of the pipeline. Um, you mentioned the hemophilia B and hurlers uh, programs, uh, phase one trials. What are the rate limiting steps or what, what needs to be uh, done so you can start to enroll patients in those, in those trials? And then secondarily, uh, was going to ask you, what would you anticipate out of those trials uh, in the second half of this year, first half of next year? 
So in terms of rate limiting steps, um, so the INDs have been cleared um, and we're in the process of opening sites and going through the um, IRB approval for sites. Um, and we will open for our, for our, H, uh, our haemophilia B program that's being the primary site is at City of Hope. For the Hurler syndrome site, that will be at, um, primary site for that is at, in Minnesota. Um, in terms, both of these studies are going to be dose escalation studies. Um, so in terms of early data, I think that the first data we're looking for here are, is safety data. But, um, and so we're not guiding to having any, any data um, from an efficacy perspective in this calendar year, but we would expect to have um, a, a, you know, a solid data set in 2017. So patient experience, maybe safety initially, and then in, in 2017, perhaps some signs of activity at least. Yes, so this is a phase one, two study. We are treating patients who have the disease, and so we're going to be looking not just for safety, but for certain measures of efficacy as well, so. Oh. And now this uh, is working. Now that's working, I was gonna say. And, and we had, we recently presented data at the um, World Symposium on our Hunter and Hurler syndrome programs. And these were mouse uh, data, so data in animal models of the disease. And we had um, some very encouraging data there, not just on the production of the um, enzyme, and I should be, say that we're using our IVPRP program, our in vivo protein replacement pro, pro, um, platform. And in this situation, we're adding, we're inserting a gene in a targeted fashion under the control of the albumin promoter and then using the patient's own liver, or the mouse's own liver in this situation, to generate the therapeutic protein. That gets secreted into the um, circulation. And so our aim there is to eliminate the need for enzyme or protein replacement therapies. That's helpful. Any questions at this point from the audience? Okay, let me ask you a question about that uh, World Symposium uh, data. You know, I'm, I'm often wondering, and sometimes investors ask me, what is the predictive value? And in, in that particular case, for those couple of diseases that you mentioned, how do you feel about the predictive value of those animal models? I think they're, they're very good. I mean, the, the, you know, we, what we can demonstrate is superphysiological levels of enzyme in the serum that enzyme is get and that enzyme is active. It's getting taken up into secondary tissues, um, including tissues that you don't normally see great ent uptake in enzyme replacement therapies. Um, the surprising thing for us was that we also saw, um, and this is a systemically administered uh, therapy. We also saw, um, we also saw effects on preservation of cognitive function in these animals. Um, we were using a Barnes maze study, and we saw statistically significant uh, improvements or statistically significant preservation of function in animals that have been treated with a zinc finger nuclease. And this was something of a surprise because I said this is a systemic study. We had done nothing particular to get it across the blood brain barrier, but because we're uh, because we're producing constant uh, amounts of stable amounts of enzyme there seems to be some way that this material is getting across the blood brain barrier that's very helpful is i'll look forward to that uh progress this year if are there any other final questions for liz before because we're out of time anyone okay thank you very much for sharing your perspectives we'll look forward to a good year of progress thanks liz